This changes everything. <laughs> I love that so much. This changes everything is the name of our brand new series that we are starting today. If I don't know you yet, just let me just let me take a second here. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. And I believe from the bottom of my heart that it's not because someone invited you. It's not because you heard about us on the internet or Facebook. It's because God has a message of hope, encouragement, and love that he wants to speak into your life today. That is why you are here. Let me hear a good amen from the people today. Amen. All right. Yeah, this changes everything is the name of our series today. And I heard somebody say, well, I don't like change. Come on, you ever hear somebody say that? Well, I don't like change. Man, they're always trying to change things around here. You ever hear somebody say that? They're always trying to change things. Well, how would you like a new car? All of a sudden, change ain't so bad, is it? No, change is good. Oh, change is good. Slow down, second service, man. New car, man. How are they growing so much over the last year? We give away cars. Yeah, that's how we do it right there. No, no, no. Change isn't always that bad. And I'm just here to tell you that I'm not... I'm not trying to change anybody today. You know, I, I didn't come here and get ready all week so I can try and change you. I do enough changing with two babies in my house. Can I get another amen on that? I ain't trying to come in here and change anybody else. Man, that's, that's just gross, man. We're not going to go there, all right? <laughs> but it's funny to me how the most traditional time of the year, that is Christmas. Christmas is the most traditional time of the year. That's when you break out. Man, everybody has got like a secret cabinet or a spot in their garage for all the traditional Christmas stuff you got to put up. Christmas is just the most traditional time of the year. But it's, it's funny to me how the most traditional time of the year was brought forth by the greatest change our world has ever known. Jesus Christ being born by a virgin to live a sinless life, to die on a cross for our sins. That's the greatest change that has ever hit the planet, and it instituted the most traditional time of the year. That's funny. All I'm, all I'm trying to say is that this series is about moving away from old habits. This series is about moving away from old habits. Traditions that may not be healthy for you, old ways of thinking, old bondages, old strongholds, because God wants to make new. Can I hear another amen on that? He wants to make new. Jesus brought that promise with him to earth when he came. And let me tell you something, he ain't about to change his mind because of you. All right, he ain't about to change his mind. Now, oh, their situation, mm, don't know if I can handle that. Oh, their issues, don't know if I can work with that. Oh, I, fr- I freed all the Israelites and took them through the water of the Red Sea. I could deal with that, but, but this situation, nah, too big. Nope, I don't think so. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is going to do for you exactly what he's been doing for people forever, and that is make things new. He wants to make you new. So let's open our Bibles to Isaiah 43. If you've got it in the, you've got it in your bulletin, you've also, we're going to, Show it on the screens here in a second. And also, if you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can get on there is the brown YouVersion Bible app, and you can click events, and you can find Lifeline Community Church, and you can find all of our notes on there with you. That's actually, I think, the best way if you've just got your phone with you to follow along with this. So Isaiah 43, starting with verse 15. I love this passage. He says, I am the Lord. Your Holy One, Israel's creator and king. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves and they drowned and their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. Somebody in here needs to know today that no matter what you are facing, no matter what kind of trials or tribulations you are going through, no matter what your circumstances hold for you, God has been doing this for a very, very long time. And God has brought you through some amazing things. But as it says already, forget all that. Forget all that. That's a funny thing for God to say. Hey, remember all those amazing things I did? I want you to go ahead and forget all that. Why? Because it's nothing compared to what I am going to do. Whoo! There's a praise break right there. There's an amen from somebody. It's nothing compared to what he is about to do in your life in the most unchanging season, in the most traditional season. God is saying, I want to, I want to breathe something new in you, something you've never seen before. 
Forget all that. Nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? Because you know you got to look for it. you got to open your eyes to see it. That's what God's saying to us. you got to open your eyes to this. It doesn't, it doesn't come to those who are looking the other way. No, it comes for those who are seeking me. Seek me and you will find me. But I don't got time to preach a whole other message to you. I got to stay on track. <laughs> I will make a pathway through the wilderness. He's saying, I will make a way where there is no way. You are facing a brick wall in your life. And God says, oh, that wall? I can take care of that. Smash! I can take care of this wall. Don't, you, don't forget that there was a sea in front of them, but I parted it for them. Your situation, your circumstance is not too much for him. It's not. It's just not. He says this. He goes on to say this. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. God is saying what was, what was once dry in your life. Man, some of you feel like the tree I got in my front yard. Like, like sad, you know, just sad. Finally, when the rain started coming back, it's like, ah, I feel better now. That's exactly what God wants to do in your life. With all this rain, everything starts to look greener, right? I thank God for some rain because of everything that we've been seeing in our state. But that's exactly what God wants to bring in your life. He wants to bring that living, fresh water. Where, where one, what once felt dry, he wants to make that nice and life-filled again for you. He wants to make that life-filled for you. God wants to do something new in your life, and he's going to do it during the most traditional time of the year. Now, see, there's, there's very few things in life that bring more change than a new baby. Can I hear one good solid amen on that? I got somebody in the house that says, yep, that's right. I did hear that. Yes, there's nothing in this whole world, naturally speaking, that brings more change than a new baby in the house. Let me tell you like this. My, my oldest girl, she's three years old. And she is so beautiful. Let me just tell you about my little girl really fast. She got the blondest, it's like glaring white hair. She's just so pretty. She's dainty, okay? And I hold her in my arms and I'm like, oh, baby, I love you. I love you so much. I love you. And then she had her first poo-poo. And I knew my life was never going to be the same ever again. Yes, Babies bring the most change out of anything. You know, nighttime used to be for sleeping. <laughs> Not anymore. Nah. Nighttime is for feeding. Nighttime is for cuddling. Nighttime is for answering the dumbest questions you ever heard in your whole life. <laughs> where do babies come from? It's only three in the morning. <laughs> I'm going to show you where they go if you don't go back to bed. No, so I remember this one day, this one day, 545 in the morning, 545 in the morning, and um, my wife and I hear a wailing from the baby's room. And we, we open our tired eyes and look right into each other's faces as if to say, there is no way on God's green earth I am getting out of this warm, cozy bed to get that screaming, mm, and I can't repeat what I said. And I, I go, mm, so I, I get up, you know, I get up. I'm not trying to get up at 545. God's not even up that early. What am I going to do getting up that early? I think it's a sin to be up that early. If you up that early, you up to no good. I'm just telling you that right now. What you doing up that early? That's not even right, okay? It's not even right. And so I go in there. You know, I do what I got to do. I go in there, and my, my little precious baby girl, again, I hold her. I'm, oh, baby, you're so sweet. I rub my beard on her face. I'm like, oh, baby, I just love you so much. And then she looks up at me with her beautiful blue eyes. She just got these clear blue eyes. And I... I look at her and she looks at me and then her eyebrows ruffle up. She goes, apple juice. I want apple juice. She said it so hard she spit on my face a little bit. I'm like, you're a baby. How do you even talk like that? Apple juice. It's 5.45 in the morning. Honey, you get nothing from me. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, I'm just telling you right now that, that babies paint the picture pretty well. And, and I know for I'm going to be taking orders from that little girl for a long time long, long time, and there's nothing I'd rather do. I love her. I love her. Don't, I'm, I'm just playing. I, I love her, but, you know, there was one baby that was born to this world that didn't just change one family. It changed all families forever and ever. That's Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life to die on that cross for us. That baby, yes, changed everything, not just for Mary and Joseph, for all of us, for all of us. Nothing changes Nothing changes things like a baby. But it's not just a change. 
that Jesus brought. It's not just a change. It's a brand new opportunity. You know, I was talking about, I was ta- I'm talking about change, you know. There's a difference between different and new. You know, th- I've gotten a lot of different cars in my driving career. You know, I go from one hoopty to another. Somebody say amen to that. You know what I'm talking about. I keep praying over your finances like somebody's going to get a new car around here and let me borrow it. I, I mean, one day, one day, Lord, I'll keep on praying for provision over this church. There's a big difference between getting a different car and getting a brand new car. So, yeah, there's a big difference between those things. And that's what Jesus wants to do. Not give you a new car. Come on, second service, man. Chill. Man, how'd you guys grow so fast? New cars. We give new cars out to people. Yeah. No, that's not what Jesus, he came to bring you a brand new life. He came to give you a brand new start. He didn't, he didn't just, he doesn't just want to tweak you. He doesn't just want to change you. Oh, man, I, I got to fix him a little bit. No, I got to fix her a little bit. No, 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 no. He wants to make you brand new. I'm I'm going to do something fresh and new. And he's, he does it with people. See, God's resources is people. God's passion is people. And that's exactly what he came to do. So let's read in our Bibles, uh, Revelation chapter 21. So if you've got your paper Bible, man, bless you for kicking it old school. And like I said, if you've got your, uh, if you've got your phone with you, you can get us on the YouVersion Bible app and follow along the notes there. Just go to events and Lifeline Church. Or you've got it in your bulletin. And we'll also have the scriptures on the screen. we got it for you. It's all good. Revelation 21. I like to kick it old school myself. Look at this paper. Look at this preacher still using paper. Come on, man, get with the times. You got a smart watch and you still use paper on your sermons? Yeah, well, you know, it's anointed, okay? It's anointed. Revelation 21, we're going to start in verse 3. We're going to start in verse 3. It said this, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look. Everybody say look. 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 That's good. Man, you guys are good. First service was weak. I mean, I'm, I'm going to just talk bad about them real fast. They were weak. You guys are like, look. I love that. Look. God's home is now among his people. What do you think he's talking about? When Jesus came to earth. God incarnate, God with us, God's throne is now among his people, but he's also, he's also speaking prophetically about the future. That, you know Jesus is coming back again, right? He came as a lamb the first time, but he ain't coming, he ain't coming like that the second time. Ooh, stay on, stay on target, stay on target. His home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. Let's talk about some brand new stuff. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Oh, man, that's, that's, some, that's some change I'm okay with right there. He will wipe away every tear from your eyes. That's, I'm all right with some change now. I'm okay with that. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. You know Jesus is coming back, and we're not going to have to deal with this forever. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that myself, just personally. I don't know about you. And one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. You know what I love about that right there? He makes it sound like he's still making things new. I keep on, it's, you can say it another way. I make things new. I continually make things new. He didn't just make one thing new. I make all thing new. I make everything new. And then he said, write this down. He was like blessing note takers right there. He was blessing some note takers right there. Write this down. But what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. That's not the first time we heard that statement, is it? Where else did he say that? He said it on the cross. He said, it's finished. I've taken it. I've taken all the sin for this world. It's finished. And he says it again right here. It is finished. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end to all who are thirsty Man, I know we got some thirsty people around here. I know we got some thirsty believers right here who are still thirsty for God's word, still thirsty for those promises that God made to us. I'm thirsty, thirsty to all who are thirsty. I will give freely from the springs of the water of life to all who are victorious, will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. This message is called good as new, good as new, because it's one thing to get something different. But it's another thing to get something new. And you know what else struck me? Right before I started preaching the first service, I, I, I started to think about it even a little bit more. You know, it's like that old pair of shoes, your favorite pair of shoes. They fit you just right. 
but you, you ran them through the mud. So what do you do? You get your rag out, man, like I did with these. You, you clean them up. You clean them up, and you scrub, and you work, and you toil, and those shoes that have done you so well, that feel so good, they are good as new. See, there are no oopsie babies in, 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 God's, in God's view. Like, your parents may not knew about you. you didn't, they didn't know you were coming, but God always knew you were coming. You are not an oopsie baby to him. He always knew. He didn't look at the Holy Spirit and be like, oh, man, didn't see that coming. What are we going to do with this one? I'm not sure. I'm not, I didn't see that coming. Oopsie baby. No, there are no oopsie babies with God. He saw you coming. That means he's always had a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. So all God is doing, he's not trying to change you into something different. All he's trying to do is restore you to what he always intended. Stop me. What he always intended for your life. He has always intended that. So he wants to make you like new, like he always intended for you to be. He wants to restore you to your original, to the original plan that he had for you. That's why I call this message good as new. Not like you need to be something different than who God made you to be. No, he is going to, he's going to make you what he always intended for you to be. He's going to break those things off. He's going to wipe those things off. He's not changing you into anything different, but he's going to get all the junk that doesn't belong there out of there so he, you can be everything that you were always supposed to be, good as new. There are three things out of Revelation 21 I want to share with you, and the first is this. Go ahead and write this down in your bulletin. This is the first blank that you could fill in, and it goes like this. You have to see it. You have to see it. He said, look, look, look. God is looking for people who are looking for him. God's word said, if you seek me, if you're looking for me, you will find me. We have to see that God has us surrounded. I was just talking with a gentleman after first service. And, you know, we all have, we all have things that we're, that we're battling with. You know, things, very real things, very real troubles that are, are coming against us. And I pray exactly what this guy prays in 2 Kings chapter 6, a man named Elisha, who was with a, a young man who was supposed to be ruling these, 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 um, this, these army troops, and they were surrounded by their enemies. Track with me for a second. You know, in this story, they were surrounded by literal enemies that were trying to kill them with swords. But you know, we can still feel like we're surrounded by enemies. Enemies like debt, enemies like bills, enemies like I made some mistakes and now those are coming back to get me, enemies like I made some bad decisions, enemies like, like my boss at work feels like my enemy sometimes. We know we all face things and it feels like we're surrounded, but God wants you to see that he has you surrounded with protection, provision, and his power. You just have to see it. Listen to this in 2 Kings 6, starting in verse 16. He says this, don't be afraid. Elisha told him. That's important too. Don't be afraid. For there are more on our side than on theirs. <laughs> Doesn't look like it. What are you talking about? No, I'm surrounded. I've got issues in my relationships. I've got issues at my job. I've got issues with my own friends. What are you talking about? I, God has me surrounded with all these good things. I don't understand that. And then Elisha prayed exactly what my prayer is for you. Lord, Open their eyes. Open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes. When he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. God has you surrounded with his protection. He has you surrounded with his power. We've got to open our eyes to see it and start to believe that. And that's because we can be so crippled with fear. We can be so crippled crippled with discouragement and depression. These are very real things in our day-to-day -day lives. And Elisha prayed exactly what I would pray for you. Lord, open their eyes. Open my eyes. I was praying this over myself this week. Lord, open my eyes to show me that this is going to be all right. God, you have me. Your power has not grown weak over the years. No, you still 
have me. God has you surrounded. Let me ask you a quick question. Who has been to a party with a pinata? Go ahead, let, show me your hand. If you, every gringo in the house has been to a party with a pinata, just like me. All right, I love, I love a party with some good pinata filled with full-size candy bars. I love it. I went to a party with a pinata, walked straight up to that colorful donkey, and said, you're going down. I can smell that candy. I'm coming for you. Give me a stick. Somebody give me a stick. And I, I'm coming for you, colorful donkey. I'm going to smash you and open you up and get all this candy. And I was going for it. And then they put a blindfold on me. And I start swinging. And somebody's laughing because they're pulling that rope. And I'm like, oh, look, oh, I can't get it. Give me that stupid donkey. I want it. But I couldn't see. I just couldn't seem to connect, you know, because I couldn't see. I couldn't connect because I couldn't see. I was the most embarrassed 30-year-old at that little kid party that you ever did see. I couldn't connect because I couldn't see. Because believers do this too. We do this in our own lives. I just can't seem to connect. I don't, see, I don't see why I need to go through growth track. I don't see why I need to get on the dream team and start serving other people. I don't see why I need to read my Bible every day. Sounds like a waste of time. I don't know why I got to pray, but I just can't seem to connect. I just can't seem to connect. Why? Because we can't see the value of pursuing God and saying, God, I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you. I'm seeking you. I want you. Just a pure heart. Just a pure, raw desire. You know, you don't even got to be, a, you don't have to be a scientist up in here. Come on. You hear me talk at all? Like, the ghetto comes out of me so quick, so easy. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just got to have some desire. You just have to have some passion to say, you know what? I'm coming for you, God. I may not understand it all, but I'm, I want to see you. I want to see what you have. I want to see what they keep talking about. I want to see that's what we do, man. We, we try and live our, our lives by sight and not by faith. But the Bible says that the just will live by faith and not by sight. So that, that sounds kind of weird. I thought you just said I'm supposed to look, but the just live by faith and not by sight. So what does that mean? Let me do my job and connect those dots for you. You can write this down. It's not in your notes or anything, but you can write this down. You have to believe God's word is truth before you see the proof. It's key. It's key. And it's hard. It's tough. And some people don't like doing that. Some people don't like being told to do that. No, you got to prove it to me. Prove it. God's real. Prove it. Prove it. Well, you know, that's why God loves kids so much. Did you know that? God, he favors kids. He favors the young. Why? They believe easy. They believe easy. He said, Jesus said, oh, y'all want to be great, right? Y'all want to be great in my kingdom? Bring a little kid up here. Where's little Johnny? Little Johnny, come on up here. Sit on my knee right here. Little Johnny. Hey, little Johnny, do you believe that I love you? Uh-huh. <laughs> what about if bad things are happening? Do you believe that I still love you? Yes, God. Why? Because they believe. So God asks for childlike faith. He favors kids. Who wants to be great in the kingdom? Someone that would just say, okay, daddy. <laughs> okay, father, I believe you. It's just like my kids. I, I tell them, I can tell them, you know, anything. You know, and, and earth, in speaking naturally, you know, that can, put, that can put some people at risk. I'm not telling you to have blind faith with people, you know, because kids could get in a lot of trouble that way. Adults could get in a lot of trouble that way. But God will never let you down. God is always good, all the time, so you can count on him. And when you start to take those steps, you will see. So I'm going to preach it to you just like that. Take a step. Believe. Live by faith, not by sight. Believe before seeing. Believe before seeing. It's not like us adults, you know. Kids, man, they'll believe you. Hey, God will have you taken care of. Okay. They love it. But us adults, we're like, hmm, he's my provision, Mm. he's going to provide for me? Mm. How's he going to do that in this economy? You're like, I'm like, wait, what? Wait, hold on a second. I, God created the stars. He created the earth. He created you. He created me. He created everything. But now he's like bound by economy. It's like, it ain't the economy that's going to bind up God's provision. But I'll tell you this right now, some unbelief can definitely bind up God's provision. He talks about it in the Bible all the time. Have faith if you have faith the size of a what? Mustard seed. You will see great things. 
if you could believe me, you will see great things. You, you, know, that, um, you know that professional athletes are trained this way. Secular coaches for professional sports teams, you know what they teach their athletes to do? They teach them to visualize success in their mind. So a, a professional baseball player walking up to the batter's box, they're trained by their batting coaches to envision the pitcher pitching the ball and them hitting a base hit. They are trained to see it in their mind before it actually happens why? Because it increases their ability to accomplish said success. Secular people are tapping into what God has been saying for thousands of years. Took you long enough, right? So if, if secular people are doing this and succeeding, then can't we just believe God? Can't we just have in our heart, God wants success for me. He, he wants me to be successful. He does have a plan for me, and it's not it's to, it's to prosper me. So number two, you have to remember it. Number two in your bulletin, number two in your notes is you have to remember it. Because some of you have already seen some great provision in your life. I know there are some seasoned saints around here that I've seen amazing things. I've heard wonderful testimonies of God's provision, God's faithfulness. Man, he comes through. But you have to remember it. And the longer you go, the harder it gets. So I've been saved 12 years now. Not that long compared to many of you. 12 years. Yeah, I got clean and sober and saved. And it doesn't take that long to start forgetting all the miraculous things God has done in your life, in your family's life, maybe a healing that took place. Maybe when you prayed earnestly for that job and then you got it. Maybe just to set you free from a secret sin in your life and you were like, just really wanted to be free from it and God really did set you free. But the longer you live in that freedom state, the easier it is to forget all the good things that God has done for you. Remember Jesus said, write this down. Remember he said, write this down. That's proof right there that God favors note takers. Hashtag note takers go to heaven. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. If you're not taking note, man, I ain't, I ain't mad at you. But there's a reason. There is a reason that God keeps telling people, hey, write this down on a stone tablet or on some paper. So just write this down because when God reveals things to us, if, if I don't write things down, I don't know about you, but if I don't write things down when I hear them, by the next day, I might just forget it. So God says, hey, write this down. He says this in Deuteronomy 8, starting in verse 10. Deuteronomy 8. When you have eaten your fill, talking about how he freed the people. He freed the people. He did them right. And he really set them free from some bondage, from some, from some slavery in their life. And some of you know exactly what this feels like to be set free from, from a life that was less than, to be set free in the freedom of Jesus. And he says this, when you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. And, and some of you, I know it, you've had some great testimonies. But he says, but that is the time to be careful. That's weird. God sets me free, puts me into a situation that I was asking for and that I'm really happy about. And he says, that is the time to be careful. What do you mean by that? Beware that in your plenty, Beware that while things are going good, you do not forget the Lord your God. What is he saying right there? You know, we live in freedom for a little while. We live in provision for a little while. And we go, oh, yeah, I don't need that anymore. Oh, yeah, I don't need that anymore. Yeah, I, I needed to go to church for a while, you know, when I was going through that one thing. But, but now I'm good. But now I'm good. It happens. It happens a lot. And God speaks to it thousands of years ago because it's in our nature to do that. It's in our nature to forget the really good things God has done in our life. And that's why he says, remember, remember, write it down, remember. For when you have become full and prosperous, you have built fine homes to live in and your flocks and your herds. Anybody got flocks and herds? But you got bank accounts, so track with me. You become very large and silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else. Be careful. Do not become, the word is proud. The word is proud. Do not become proud because I, I said this in first service, I was like, man, should I say this? But some of you, some of you, you ask God for something big at some point in your life, and you got it, and you got it. 
Now think about that thing right now. When's the last time you thanked God for that thing? It's easy to forget. It's easy to forget when God rescues you and some time goes by and we become proud and say, oh, well, I'm good. You know, oh, so-and-so, yeah, they need it. So-and-so, man, I better get them to church because look at them. They need this. Oh, yeah, they need to start giving because they need breakthrough. Oh, they need to start doing this because they need breakthrough. Yeah, I did all that. I did all that. I'm speaking to, I'm speaking to folks who have known Jesus for a little while, for a moment. I'll get back to everyone else in a minute. But some of you know the Lord and, and need to be careful. I, I consider myself in that. We need to be careful that we do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from your slavery in the land of Egypt. Jumping down to verse 18, he says, remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful. It wasn't you. It, it wasn't me who accomplished a new job and, and, and got that raise and Let's just, let's just put it back on church leaders for a minute. It wasn't me who made the church grow. It wasn't, it wasn't that one leader. Who, it wasn't us. It is the Lord that gives us the ability to be prosperous. It is always him. And the second I forget that, I'm in trouble. The second we forget all the good things the Lord has done for us, we are in trouble. Remember the Lord your God. He's the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the government that he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. He promised it to you, but don't forget where it comes from. Don't forget where it comes from. It tends to be a, a, a pattern that the longer we've been out of slavery, we forget about our slavery. What did the, what did the Israelites say after they got out of slavery for like a couple months? I want to go back to Egypt. It was nice there. They had pots of meat, and they were so nice to us. Just a couple months earlier, God save me. And then just a couple months goes by, and they're like, man, this is hard work. It's like praying for a job. God gives it to you, and then you, two months later, you start complaining about your boss. It's kind of like the same thing. Just fill in the blanks in your own life. It's it's, it's all of us, though. It's all of us. That's why I tell people this one trick. This is a trick for you to remember the good things God has done in your life. Write down your testimony. Write down your testimony. It can just be the size of this one page. And I don't care if you've been in church your whole life. Like my wife, she'd been in church her whole life. Raised in church, been a disciple, went as a missionary overseas. Like she, she holy. Okay, she's holy. And then there's me. I came to Jesus as an adult from addiction and, and drugs and alcohol. And it, no matter who you are, you have a testimony. No matter who you are, you have something that God set you free from. You have something that God did in your life. All I'm asking you to do is write that thing down and never forget it. Me, I have a 60-second version of my testimony. I have a five-minute version of my testimony. And I have a 20-minute version of my testimony. It just depends how much time I have with you. <laughs> and I'll share it with you. And I, I, and I like people to, to know their testimony for two reasons. For one, that you'll always be ready to give an account for the hype, if you're more like me, or the hope, if you're more sensible, to give an account for the hope that is in you. And reason number two, that you will never forget all the good things God has done in your life. It's so important. It's so important because we get in trouble. We get in trouble so easy. We got to remember this. Our relationship with Jesus is not transactional. It's not transactional. You didn't earn being made new. So your testimony, you didn't earn it. So remember that in your testimony. You didn't earn it. No, God saved me from that. He set me free from that. There was only one transaction that's ever been made in this sense. Jesus paying the price for our sins on the cross. That's it. And once that's happened, once that transaction is happening in your life, it's already happened. Once you receive it, you have to own it. And that's my third point for you is you get to own it. What really is you get to own it, but you have to own it. You have to own it. Remember this. Jesus said, it's finished. It's finished. Own it. Own it. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Anyone who's thirsty. Is anybody thirsty in here today? I'm not talking about water. Are you, thirsty for the, are you thirsty for the things that you know God has promised you? 
Are you thirsty for a different way of living? Are you thirsty for being set free from the thing that keeps on wearing at your life and you feel so empty inside? Are you thirsty? Are you seeking God? Do you want that in your life? Well, Jesus has come to me and I will let living water flow in your life. Own it. I'll come, you come to me, I will do my part. You come to me, I will do my part. Yes, it's the free gift of new life. It's paid, but you have to receive that gift. You didn't work for it. He paid the price for it, but you still got to receive it. It's like, you know, it's Christmas time. I thought I ought to wrap a little gift for y'all and say, you know, this gift, this free gift for anybody who wants it, snap. She was in first service. Come on now. It's a free gift. There is a gift in there too. It's a free gift. Now, did she work for that? No, you didn't work for it. If you worked for it, I'd be like, go mow the grass, and then I'll give you that. No, she didn't earn it. She just... Stood up, even though people were watching. Oh my gosh, people are watching me, I can't. Even though people were watching, she stood up and said, this is something I want, so I'm going to take, own, I'm going to own it. And now you own it. It's yours now. I, I gave it to you as a free gift. It's free. <laughs> but you, did you know this? Hold up. Some of you think I'm only talking about salvation today. Some of you are thinking, oh, well, I'm already saved, so this doesn't apply to me. Did you know that 1 Corinthians 14.1 says to eagerly seek spiritual gifts? Sounds to me like this salvation we're talking about is a gift that keeps on giving. Like you need to continue to pursue the gift that God has for you. God has continual gifts. This blows my mind, but it's true. 87% of Christians in the body, church-going, Bible-believing Christians, 87% of them don't know what their spiritual gift is, whether it's leadership, whether it's hospitality, whether it's mercy, you know, whether it's anything. We don't know what it is because we receive the free gift and be like, whew, glad that's over. I got my gift. I'm good. I, I, it's good. I'm done. I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm done. But no, he says to continue to seek spiritual gifts. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about why we do growth track. I'm talking about why we have a dream team because we take people through growth track, which is during the second service every single week, and we want to help you discover your spiritual gift. I don't want to fall in that 87% category. I want, I want the people that come to this church to know what their spiritual gifts are so, so that you can serve in it and receive that fulfillment that comes from actually walking in that gift. It's amazing. But what I want you to do today is this, truly. To so know and believe that this gift from God is for everyone and it's free as can possibly be. So the first gift, salvation. And it's free as can be. But the gift that keeps on giving, man, God wants to give you spiritual gifts so that you can use them to make a difference in the life of another person. You know, that's kind of why I get really excited. If you can't tell already, maybe it's your first time here, and you're like, man, this guy is like kind of excitable, isn't he? Why is he always yelling? I'm like, this is like, are you shouting at me? I'm not shouting at you. I'm shouting because I'm pumped, because I'm excited. You know, it, it's, it blows my mind that Justin Bieber could walk in those doors right now and some of you be like, oh, my God, this is Bieber. Oh, my God, there he is. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, and we're like so excited. We're like, oh, my God, there he is. <laughs> Thousands of young girls bawling their eyes out at a Justin Bieber concert. Oh. <laughs> but we come to church, to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who set us free from every single bondage that could ever be on that. And we'd be like, mm, somebody's looking at me. Oh, maybe I'll do one. Ooh, maybe I'll carry the TV. You ever seen this one? I'll carry the TV first. And you, you have it in your pockets and you're like, mm, oh, I got one right here and then I'm going to have two. And then maybe like half mass and I'm, I might say something. Amen. Does somebody hear me? It's like... It's like, come on, come on, for Justin Bieber, for people we don't even know. I went to a Stockton Kings game. How many of you knew there was the Stockton Kings? Not the Sacramento Kings, the Stockton Kings. Raise your hand. Okay, so how about half of you? There is, there is Stockton Kings, and, and um, 
my boy Daniel, Pastor Daniel, gave me a couple tickets so I could go see the Stockton Kings. Let me tell you something, they're good. And with the Stockton Arena, man, they jam, okay? They're like, uh, they're going through and they're going, man, because they want to, you don't want to do something, so they're going for it. And they're like, ooh, alley-oop, a uh, boom. And everybody in the whole stadium is like, yeah. And I get into it too. I'm like, yeah. And I ask Tiffany, I'm like, who is that guy again? I don't even know who it is. I'm like, who are these people? They're like nobodies, you know? They're like living in Stockton, signed up for this team, but they can ball, man. And they're good. I don't even know these people. And I'm like, yes. So when I come into church, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Man, how about the one, how about the one who, who set me free from it all? That's why I, I'm willing, even this last week, I was on vacation, but I went to church anyways because I love going to church and hearing the word of the Lord. I just, I, I, I resolved that in my heart a long time ago. Every single Sunday or whatever day church is, I'm going to church. I don't care. I don't care if I'm a pastor. I don't care if I pastor a church. I don't care what's going on in my life. I don't care if I'm in Hawaii or if I'm in whatever. I don't care if I'm on staycation, vacation. I'm going to church. I don't care because that's, my, that's the Lord's house. I'm going. I'll see you there if you're there. <laughs> and I was in a church. So I was in a church, and the, the pastor was, like, talking, and he said something. I was like, amen. And somebody looked over at me like, you talking? I'm like, yeah, I'm talking. I'm like, he, he said something really cool. So I was like, yeah. And they were like, what you doing? <laughs> and, you know, so I was like, okay, I didn't want to be a spectacle either. You know, I wasn't trying to make a show. It's not about me. I don't want you to see me. But I don't want to hold back a response that the Lord deserves. So that's why in worship, if I'm not up on this platform, I might be like right here doing a little bit of this number right here. That's just because I'm so grateful. And I would encourage you, I would encourage you to think the same way, man. Don't just, don't just save your praise for Bieber, all right, for the Bieber fever, man. You don't need all that. I'm going to talk about, talk about Jesus fever. Come on, somebody. Let me give you some applications today. Man, I guess it's time to wrap this message up, huh? Let's wrap it up with some application because I believe that if I just sit here and, and, and say all some fun things and you can, like, post it on Instagram or something, that would be cool. But I want to give you something you can do when you leave here today. That's really important to me that it's not really a good message until I gave you something that you can do in your life. That's, that's just the way I see it. So number one thing I want you to do, this is in your notes, see by faith, not by sight. See by faith and not by sight. And we say it like this because that can be a little misleading because we say, oh, I believe, and it's all right here. But our actions don't reflect what we believe because it's all right here. It hasn't gone down here yet. We say it like this. Faith isn't simply believing God can, it's living like he will. I'm going to make choices believing that God will. Not just knowing that he can, but believing that he will. If you want to see God move in your life, listen to this. If you want to see God move in your life, you have to believe that he will move into your life. You have to believe that he will move in your life. Does that make sense today? This is that we've got, to, we've got to see it by having faith that acts. You know, I heard a great message from a, from a Bible teacher up in Jackson. Yeah, you get good Bible teachers up in Jackson. I'll tell you this right now. And she told me a great illustration. Sylvia Weaver, bless her heart. Man, she teaches Bible college over there. She's wonderful. She told me an illustration, faith versus trust. So faith is the word we like to use. Faith is believing that, that you can push a wheelbarrow across dental floss that's stripped a, a, along the Grand Canyon. <laughs> you're like, you, you lost me. <laughs> it's all right. Faith is believing that God can do that. If God wanted you to do it, he'd let you do it. And I, I believe it. But trust is picking up the wheelbarrow and start walking. Because a lot of us believe, but then when it comes down to it and we're faced with a decision, faith is right here. Faith is when I'm faced with a decision, I'm going to have faith to believe that even if I tell the truth right now, that might compromise my job, but I believe that God will have my back and he will support me if I do his word. Even though I may not see, I'm going to live my life as if he's going to show up. You know, there's a, for some of you, that might mean starting our growth track. I already talked about it a little bit, but our growth track is the one on-ramp into everything we do here, joining the dream team. And some of you, like the pinata, you know, you may not see. You may not see how 
uh, going through growth track and, and joining the dream team, you know, the greeters, the ushers, the people that are working in the life center, how is that going to make a difference? You know, how is that going to, how is that going to, you know, change my life? And, you know, I, I'm not going to make a big difference. Uh, but there was a guy named Maslow. He was a sociologist and he wrote some books. And if you went to college in the last 20 years, you've heard of him. He, he came up with the five um, hierarchy. Hierarchy, the hierarchy of needs, okay? And since then, now it's eight, there's eight tiers there of needs. So once you get past the need for food and shelter, then you move on to the need to feel loved, and then you move on to the need to feel accepted, and blah, 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 blah. The very, very top one, this is a secular sociologist, secular. The very top need of any human being ever is the need for transcendence. You know what that means? Making a difference in the life of another person. It's the greatest need that every human being has is to make a difference in the life of another. My life doesn't really amount to much because I've done some funerals in my career. You know, who, who did you change? That's why when you invite someone to church with you and you give them that single card that's on your chair and you give it to them and they actually come because it's Christmas time, I guess I'm supposed to, but then they come and hear some preaching and then at the end I offer them Jesus and you open one eye and look at them. And they go like this, that'll be the best day of your life. Not only of their life, that'll be the best day of your life because you will feel the fulfilled need of transcendence. I just made, I just made a difference in the life of another person. I changed them forever. You know, you want to know what the dream team accomplished this, this last year? Because people were holding crying babies, because people were printing bulletins, because people were practicing all week long to get these songs right because people keep clicking the pro presenter to the next slide because people are holding the cameras just right so people can watch online because the dream team does what they do 196 people committed their lives to christ this this year we baptized 33 people in water we baptized 33 people in water doubling the year before And because the dream team has stepped up and, and, do, and has done everything they do, people have been coming more and more. So 17 to 18, the, the church has grown by like 60%. And it's not because Tiffany and me. You think if we just stood up here on the stage by ourselves? <laughs> no, it's because they're standing out there holding stupid signs that say, we love you already. Or they, they greet you with a handshake and say, you know what, we love you. And it starts to... It starts to break down. That's why people are ready when I finally get to that. It's not just me. It's the dream team. It's because a group of people said it's not about me anymore. I'm going to give my life to make a difference in the life of another person. That's what serving on the dream team is all about. And that's an invitation I make to every single one of you today. Go to Growth Track. Get on the dream team. Number two, connect to the source. Connect to the source. If you really want to take this message and run with it, if you really want to take what I've been, I've been telling you and, and really apply something to your life, then you've got to stay close to Jesus. John 15 says this, that, that Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Remain in me, I will remain in you, for apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you remain in me, you will produce much fruit. Well, how do we remain in Jesus? That's a good question, don't you think? How do we remain in Jesus? I'll tell you, by reading the Bible, by praying, and by worshiping. I'm talking about in our own time. And if you're new to faith, I wanna just go ahead and release you right now to, to feel some freedom, to just start small. Start small, it's okay. We call it the first 15. And you know what it is? It's five minutes in your Bible, five minutes in prayer, and five minutes in worship. Five minutes in your Bible. Just pick up your Bible first thing in the morning, right when you wake up. Everybody's got 15 minutes. Just nod at me if you know history. You got 15 minutes. You can wake up a little bit early and give God the first part. Just read one chapter and see that it won't change your whole perspective for the whole day. Read one chapter. Pray for five minutes. Now that might sound like a long time right now, but let me tell you how to pray. Thank God for everything he's given you. I did it this morning. This morning, it was, it was dark outside still, and I'm cold, and I'm, I'm trying to 
So I'm walking back and forth in my living room and I just look around. Lord, thank you for my cat. I'm sleepy, but I, I know that this principle is true. I need to thank God for everything. Thank you for my cat. And then I looked over. Thank you for my couch. <laughs> and then I looked up and I said, thank you for this roof. Thank you that I didn't sleep in the rain last night. And then I thought about the bedroom. I said, thank you for my wife. Thank you for my kids who are sleeping. And then it just started to steamroll, you know. Just start by thanking God. Thank Him for everything you could think of. And then make your requests known to Him. If you have any requests, if you have anything you need, ask Him. Lord God, would you, would you please help me preach this morning? Lord God, would you please help me uh, do well at my job? Lord, would you please help me with this relationship that I'm struggling with? Lord, would you please help me with my parents? Would you please help me with my kids? Just ask Him. We have not because we ask not. So pray. And then worship is the easy one, y'all. May I sign up for some Spotify? Man, if you're over 25, let me just explain to you. Type in Spotify on Google. Sign up for a free, it's free. Type in Hillsong and let it ride, okay? You just one song and sing along to it. It's called doing that on your own time. You start your day that way, I promise you. You do that for 30 days. Do it all December. First 15, try it. You being connected to the source and starting your day that way, oh, it's going to change everything. It's going to change your whole perspective. It's going to change everything, staying connected to the source. And number three, last thing, last application is this. I want you to receive the gift. For some of us, let me, let me talk to the men in the room for a second. For some of us, receiving something free can be difficult. Someone wants to do something nice for you, and you're like, how much? Let me pay you for that. Someone does a favor for us. Let me get you back for that because it's uncomfortable for us to receive something we didn't earn. Ladies too, all of us, it can be hard to receive something for free, but God said, this is my free gift to you. You may want to work for it, but you can't work for it. If you work for it, then it's not a free gift anymore. And I have declared that it's a free gift to you. Let me tell you a quick story and then we'll close it up. My son is two years old, my youngest son. And um, my oldest son is 14. But like I mentioned, um, when he was a baby, I wasn't, I, w I wasn't there for him. And so that's a rough part of my, that's part of my testimony though, because God has set me free and he's with us, he's with us all the, every weekend just about. And that's a praise report in and of its own. But my two-year-old son, I, I'm around the house, I'm doing some laundry, just this last week. And he walks up to me with his diaper butt. He walks up and he looks up at me and goes, Dad, what doing? That's baby talk for, Dad, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I know what's coming next, but y'all don't know what's coming next. I know what's coming next. I said, but I'm, I'm doing the laundry. I'm doing the laundry. And the, and the dryer's over there. So he turns around, his diaper butt starts wagging. I help you. I help you. That's baby talk for, Dad, I'm, I'm going to help you with this chore. Hopefully it gets me some points later. And so he grabs a sock out of the dryer, one sock. That, that pair of socks ruined, okay? He grabs one sock and he walks over to my bed, lays it on the bed, I did it, I did it, I did it. And so what am I gonna say? I'm like, good job, son. I was, I, che I cheered him on, of course I did. I'm not a dirt bag. I'm like, yeah, man, you did it. Good job. All right. And some of us do that too with our Father in heaven. We say, God, look, I did it. Our part that we did was like nothing. And then we're like, try, we try to give ourselves some credit. You know, look, I, I did it. You know, I showed up. I did this. I do this. I do that. And God's like, yeah, you did. Good. Good. But you know, it's not my son's work ethic. That makes me love him. Well, he didn't even do anything. But you know what I really love? I love when he walks to me. And you parents, you know. When he walks up to me and goes, Dad, up. It's better than him helping me with the laundry, I'll tell you that right now. I just think about it. I just think about it. Up, Dad. And then I pick him up. And you know what he says next? It's real. Hug. 
kissed. I taught my son it's all right to be kissed and hugged by his father. It's important to me. I love that way more than him getting some work done, earning it. I, I know we got some hard workers in here. I know, I know some of you, man, you, sh you showed up, you're here, you're doing good. But let me tell you something. Your work ethic and everything that you could try to do will never make God love you anymore. He already loves you more than you could ever earn more than you could ever earn. But you know that sometimes it's really sad that sometimes I'm busy with something. I'm writing a sermon or something and I'm writing and he comes at me and says, up. I'm like, oh, I'm too busy. Or I've got something else in my hands, you know, and he is big. If you met my son, he's like, he got size like 16 diamond. He's like, pick me up, dad. I dare you. I'm like, oh, I can't because you're too heavy. But let me tell you something about your father in heaven right now. I don't want you to ever forget this. He is never too busy to pick you up. And your burdens are never too heavy for him to carry. That's where this little analogy falls short. Our Father in heaven is unlike any father on earth. He always has time for you. He can carry every struggle that you've ever had in your whole entire life. And he stands there with that gift and says, just, I just want you to reach up for it. Would you just reach up for it? You lift your arms to me and I will pick you up. Every head down, every eye closed. I just know there are some of us in here today that, that are ready to do just that. We're ready to lift our arms up and say, Father, I can't do it on my own. I've tried to do it on my own. It doesn't work. But Lord, I'm ready to come to you. I'm ready to, I'm ready to receive everything this guy was talking about and say, Lord, I, I want to come to you. And some of us in here, we, we want to give our lives to Jesus for the very first time. Some of you in here, you used to walk with the Lord. You used to be really close with him. But you're ready to come back and say, like the prodigal son, say, Father, would you just, would you take me back? But we can't even get the words out of our mouth because God runs to us. He runs to us to receive us. He can see us coming from a mile away and says, my son, my son, my daughter, she's coming back and I'm ready for you. So if that's you today, you would say, count me in this salvation prayer today. If that's you on the count of three, I want to ask you to do just that, to lift your arms up. So if that's you today, you want to give your life to Jesus, give your life back to Jesus. One, two, three, go ahead and just lift your arms to him and say, Father, here I am. You can have all of me. Yes, I see your hands. Yes, I see your hands right there in the the name of Jesus. I see your hand. I see your hand. God has been waiting for this moment for a very long time. It doesn't surprise him at all. And he would receive you with all the grace and the mercy and forgiveness of all of your sins. So let's pray this prayer together. Just pray it right after me. Father God, I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sins and make me new. Fill me with your spirit. Direct my path and restore me. I love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we clap?